Okay. Hello, everybody. It's great to have you all online this afternoon, and you are very welcome to uh, follow this excited state on stage color and biocolorance event. My name is Riikka Raisanen. I'm working at the University of Helsinki as a researcher, and I'm the leader of the biocolor research program who is organizing this event tonight, to, uh, today. So this seminar is also part of the research-based knowledge event series. The year of research-based knowledge is jointly in initiative organized by Ministry of Education and Culture, the Academy of Finland, and Federation of Finnish Learned Societies. The aim is to make research-based knowledge even more visible and accessible, and to intensify the collaboration between organizations working with research-based knowledge. So let's go to our program. Today we will have uh, research specialists and highly interesting topics. Firstly, I will shortly tell you uh, about today's uh, theme, uh, color and biocolorants. Then Professor Monika Österberg from uh, Aalto University will lead us to the topic nature as inspiring source of biocompounds and materials. Then we will have an international guest, Professor Laurent Dufos from uh, University of Reunion Island from Indian Ocean, so far, far away. And he will introduce us to fungal colorants, which already are a part of bio-based industry. Then two young researchers from the Biocolor Project, uh, Rafael Grande from Aalto University and Mikko Herrala from the University of Eastern Finland, will give us glimpses how they got involved with biocolor research. And finally, the University of Helsinki uh, Chemistry Lab Kadolin will um, present Art of Chemistry by Ida Koskinen. And we hopefully have uh, time for discussion and con uh, conclusions at the end. And here uh, in the slides, you can see the link to Presemo, through which you can leave your comments and questions. And I will pick out those uh, questions, and uh, we, I will present them to speakers after the presentation. So if you have any, if you get any questions and um, comments, please send them through this link. You will also find this link uh, in the Think Corner cornered event page. Color is a very familiar topic for everyone. We see colors everywhere around us, in nature particularly, but also in objects of man-made. But do we pay attention of color? Or do we think about where the color comes from? Why and how we see color? If we think just the natural sciences point of view of the color phenomenon, we end up to conclusion that uh, many fields of science can focus on color from its research angle. The beginning of the organic chemistry was actually much of color chemistry. For example, the invention of the first synthetic dye in the middle of the 19th century and discovery of benzene structure, which really expanded the color formulation and new dye innovations. Biocolor, what is it? Biocolor is a research consortium that has bio-based compounds in its core. It aims to increase the utilization of biocolorants by carrying out research concerning the entire production chain, starting from the biomass, oops, starting from the, from the biomass 
produced by agriculture, forest industry and other side streams, and microbes. Then concentrating on extraction of colorful compounds, purification and separation. Testing the toxicity of colorants and applying the safe ones to textiles, packaging and coatings. Biocolor Consortium also wants to study consumer aspects of biocolorants and products dyed with them and investigate how consumers cope with, with uh, the new colorants and items. The information produced by the research project of the consortium, as well as previously published data, will be compiled to BioColor database, which will serve researchers, educators, companies and enthusiasts. Today's topic, excited state, refers to in addition to my excitement about this event today, the molecule which produces color. Colorful molecules need to have a chain of conjugated double bonds and single bonds, which make the color producing part of the compound. This is called the chromophore. In the normal state, molecule is it in ground state, with minimum energy. By interaction with radiation, molecules can undergo transitions into energy-rich stages, excited stages. And when energy gets absorbed by a molecule, it turns into excited state. And these absorptions occur only at particular energy levels or wavelengths. As electrons in a compound absorb certain wavelengths of the visible light, others are reflected, and those, the sum of absorbed and reflected spectrum, we can see as color. So without light, we could not see colors. With an increasing number of conjugated chromophores, these conjugated double bonds and single bonds, the excited state becomes more resonance stabilized than the ground state. It absorbs uh, photons constantly and reflects others, and such molecule produces strong color. Like in this figure, this pisane, which uh, has uh, conjugated double and single bonds, but only uh, in, a, in a short uh, it's a small molecule with uh, no color, whereas quercetin has a spectrum and shows a, a yellow color. In nature, uh, we see a lot of colors, and nature is very manifold with specular variation of compounds and phenomena to study, and from which to learn. So let's hear about our researchers and their stories of today. And uh, firstly, I would like to uh, call on the stage um, Monika Österberg. So Monika, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rita. So it's a pleasure for me to be here today and just give me a moment to share the screen. Okay, are you now seeing just the one slide? I hope so. Okay, so um, today I want to tell you a few examples uh, of the work that we are doing. And I will not only talk about uh, uh, biocompounds and biomaterials, but also 
of solutions that are inspired by nature. So, first of all, uh, we in my group, we work a lot to, uh, with different compounds that you can get from the tree. So, So first of all, uh, from the tree, you can get the cellulose fibers that are used in textiles uh, uh, or in, in paper, uh, paper and uh, board and packaging uh, cellulose fibers are used. And then you can also make uh, textiles from cellulosic uh, fibers by uh, regeneration. But you can also use this uh, smaller uh, fibrils and this, the cellulose in the tree, that is the uh, load-bearing material, and that may, and this hierarchical structure of the uh, cell wall and the whole makes makes the uh, wood such a strong material. And uh, other uh, compound that is very um, that is about uh, makes up about thirty percent uh, of the cell wall is is lignin. And this is uh, less used. Uh, it has a brown uh, color, and it's a, it's actually like a, a side product from from biorefineries and from uh, pulp, pulping when you want to get rid of this. So this is a less. It has been classically used for burning mostly, but we have a, we have used the lignin to produce this kind of well-defined spherical particles, and I will give you some examples of how these can be uh, utilized in different materials. And uh, uh, if you look at this picture here, uh, you can see the bark and the bark is protecting the wood. So just as your skin uh, is protecting uh, your organs, um, the bark is also protecting um, uh, the tree. So in, and this is done by both mechanically, of course, uh, but also due to the a lot of active compounds that you can find in the bark that have, they can be radical scavenging, they can be uh, uh, protecting from UV degradation. And this is something we are also utilizing in our research so that we extract these active compounds from the bark and use them to make functional materials. So we use this different uh, compounds uh, or, or particles that you can get from the tree and make different kind of uh, materials with, the, with ad, added value. But let's uh, get into this, how to be inspired um, by nature. So um, one reason that was inspired by nature was uh, using uh, carnauba wax that you can get from the uh, carnauba tree. This is unfortunately not growing in, in Finland. Uh, but what we wanted to do in this uh, research that was inspired by nature uh, was that we wanted to do uh, water repellent and breathable textiles and wood uh, coatings that uh, uh, used only non-toxic bio-based material. And this uh, research was done by two of my former PhD students. They have both graduated. Nina Forsman uh, worked on textiles and Alina Lashesnikova uh, worked on wood modification. So uh, what makes a surface hydrophobic? Uh, to make a surface really, make a surface hydrophobic, you need first of all to have low surface energy. So for this, you can use different oils, waxes, and fluorocarbons are unfortunately used a lot in, in textiles and um, in other materials, but they are not very sustainable. So of course we want to use more, for example, bio-based materials. But if you have only, only the, if you have a smooth surface and only uh, low surface energy, you can get a water contact angle of around 120. 
If you want to go higher, you need to add also uh, surface roughness. And this is what was inspired by nature. So if we look, for example, at the lotus leaf, you can see here that uh, the water droplets forms uh, almost a, a full perfect sphere. So the contact angle of the water is almost 180 degrees. And these kind of droplets are easily, well, easily off here. And if we take a microscope and look at the structure here, so when, uh, if we study the chemistry, we know that there's some waxes that would blow surface energy there, but if that's not enough. We also have this kind of a hierarchical surface roughness. So we have a bit uh, micron scale bumps that are then covered with, uh, with nanoscale roughness. And this kind of roughness introduces air pockets into the uh, material. So then the water droplets is actually only mostly in contact with air and not so much with the material. And this gives rise to the very high surface, uh, high uh, hydrophobicity. And this makes the uh, protects from water or make the water droplet to roll off. So how could we achieve this on textiles? or on wood. What we did, um, well, first of all, if we look at the un, uncoated uh, cellulosic material, this can be wood, this can be a textile, this can be a composite. Um, the water droplet will spread on it and it will also be absorbed into the uh, material. So this is quite often something you want to avoid. Uh, what you like with, the, with this natural material is why the uh, cotton textiles feel so comfortable, for example, why wooden material uh, are nice, is that they are uh, breathable. So uh, water vapor can go be absorbed, but also released. And uh, this makes it uh, comfortable to wear. And uh, if we think about the wooden material, uh, this kind of... Uh, material that has this uh, uh, buffering effect, they can actually uh, buffer the uh, changes in, in uh, humidity in, in the room. So if you have a lot of people uh, in, in a room, it becomes humid, and then the, the wooden walls can absorb a bit of this humidity, and then it can release it again uh, when it's more dry. And this makes uh, it comfortable. Uh, usually, when we protect either wood or textiles, we use some kind of film-forming material. And this can then introduce the hydrophobicity, so it protects from liquid water. But unfortunately, this is not breathable. So it uh, uh, removes this nice breathability that the cellulosic material had. And uh, what we did uh, was instead that we were inspired by the nature, so we needed and knew that if we increase the roughness, we will get a good hydrophobicity. And then we realized that we can have a very thin uh, particulate uh, coating, and this will uh, be water resistant, but it will still uh, let this water vapor to go through. And this we did using uh, aqueous carnival wax particle dispersion. So it's, and the way it's done, is by layer by layer deposition. But this can be also done by spraying or uh, brushing. So it's very simple. You can take the, the root or the textile, uh, dip it into a platonic uh, polyelectrolyte uh, solution, aqueous platonic polyelectrolyte solution, or a, or a protein in this case, we, uh, we used uh, polylysine. And then uh, that uh, changes the, the charge of the cellulose to positive, and then the anionic wax particles adsorb onto the layer. And you can add more, more layers, how much you want. You don't need many layers for it to be efficient. So this is quite, quite a simple and straightforward way, and we're only using natural materials to uh, get the hydrophobicity. So let's see if I'm able to show the video. No, probably. Um, so the 
these two are our materials. So they are uh, just two bilayers with polylysin and wax particles. Uh, they have been treated in different um, uh, heat treatment. And then we compared to shoe spray and green lac Greenland wax, which is something that uh, Fjeldreven is uh, selling. So 20 minutes after this, we can see that uh, uh, these are a bit sticky. So the water is stays there and it, you can see that it's still uh, left uh, wet afterwards. So even if these are like, uh, looks like the droplet is, uh, it's hydrophobic, it's also, uh, it's not so uh, nicely um, hydrophobic, while these ones, uh, our system can be easily removed and it's almost dry afterwards. So this means that, uh, for example, this could be quite efficient uh, uh, to protect against rain, rain or something. And the same thing is shown uh, here uh, with some data points. So this, uh, sorry that it's a bit messy, but if we take the uh, the back, Greenland backs, for example. So if we have one coating layer, then the, it's breathable. We can see here we have a high water vapor uh, permeability, but it's not very hydrophobic. So the uh, contact angle is around 110. If we add a thicker layer, which is this here, uh, then it's not any more breathable, but we get a bit higher contact angle of water. And uh, uh, but our wax particles, they can combine these two uh, things. So we don't need to make compromises. We get very high contact angle around uh, 100, uh, almost 150, depending on, on the temperature treatment and very uh, excellent water vapor permeability. So with this very, uh, these are also, as you, thin so you can't uh, uh, you don't actually see it and uh, this is uh, examples of some um, uh, garments that were made and then treated so what you can if we come uh, link this now to the biopolar project what you can actually do is you can add the colorant uh, into the wax particle and then you can um, this. So in this case, for example, uh, this color was, was inside the wax. So this is a very uh, simple and scalable uh, process to make uh, a breathable and uh, water resistant uh, textile or wood coatings. So let's move back to the material that we can get from wood. So uh, lignin, uh, works as the binder in the plant cell wall, but it's a, uh, and it's a renewable source, of course, and uh, it's underutilized. So it's a side product from the biorefineries that uh, nowadays is getting a lot of attention when we want to use uh, all, all uh, streams. So we don't want to have side streams because we want to utilize everything and, and no, not making any kind of waste. So, but, uh, um, but there has been like the traditionally problems with, with the utilization of, of lignin. And the reason for that uh, is that uh, crude lignin, uh, it's, uh, it's quite heterogeneous. So the, I haven't added here the uh, chemical structure, maybe I should have done, but it's actually the chemical structure uh, is very much much dependent on on the biological source of lignin and also on the process from where it's taken. So when we do pulping, for example, uh, the focus in, is to get the cellulose fibers as intact as possible, at, and uh, and we don't care about the lignin. So then uh, there happens uh, chemical uh, reactions in the lignin, which uh, makes it a bit smelly and makes it also uh, more difficult to use. So usually it makes uh, also, it uh, quite, has quite poor solubility, especially the lignin that you get from uh, bioethanol bio uh, 
industry, for example, it's very condensed and very difficult to, to solubilize. So our approach was to take this heterogeneous material, uh, solubilize it in an organic solvent, and then by uh, self, then just pouring this dissolved lignin uh, into water, we can we form spontaneously uh, spherical colloidal lignin particles, and this then so then we have an aqueous dispersion of. Uh, of the spherical particles. And this is much easier to, to disperse either as dry or, or use as wet. So then the, um, the idea is that we can increase the uh, possible uses of, of lignin by uh, producing these uh, uh, lignin particles. And uh, this uh, uh, self-assembly or nanoprecipitation method, uh, it's, uh, it's scalable and it's uh, uh, very simple. So I will show you a few examples of what the applications that we can uh, use the lignin particles for. So, for example, for coatings or as adhesives, they are they are very efficient, and uh, they can they are also very efficient as uh, stabilizers for for emulsions, so oil and water emulsions, for example. They can work as pickering emulsion stabilizers, and you can use them in, in composites or even for biomedical applications. I don't have time to go through all these examples, so I will only give you a couple. So my first example is that you can use these uh, uh, lignin particles to make durable, scalable, and multi-resistant nanostructured coatings. So this is an... Uh, scanning electron microscope image of the coating. So you can see uh, the small spherical particles here. And this is then a stool that has been coated uh, with this uh, uh, particle, particulate coating. So what you can see is that actually this uh, uh, brown color is quite useful if, if we think about the wood coating. So in, in uh, um, for, for like the uh, outdoor furniture uh, or your terraces, this is something that you usually want to have this kind of a color. And I use this uh, picture also to show that this is not only research done in, in nanoscale in the lab, but we can actually produce this uh, uh, coating in a bit larger scale. And uh, now we are, uh, we are trying to commercialize this and also... Um, see how, how it works in real life. So um, the water resistance for this is a bit similar, working at the same uh, principle as what I showed for the wax particles. So if we have the uncoated wood, then the, uh, the water will both uh, penetrate the wood and it will spread on the surface. And uh, uh, this um, illustrates now the the water vapor, so that also goes through and comes out again in the uncoated wood. But the problem is uh, here that we usually want to protect the wood from, from liquid water. We want to protect it from stains and, um, and such things. And then we can use this lignin particle particulate uh, coating. So with the particulate coating, uh, we can still have the uh, vapor to go through because we are using such a thin layer. So this is a big difference to, to many other coatings is that we can use quite a thin layer, uh, but we also uh, get quite good hydrophobicity. So it's protecting from, from water. And if we compare this uh, to the wax particles, we are gaining, uh, this one is also, it's uh, covalently bound. So, uh, it's actually much more resistant to solvents uh, and, and also it's mechanically quite strong. So this, we have tested the mechanical strength also of this. And then again, if we compare to the, uh, some lacquer or, or thicker wax uh, uh, film forming coating, then uh, we don't have the, uh, the ab 
absorption and release of the of the water vapor. So then that means that uh, if we have a lot of humidity in indoors, this will build up indoor uh, in the atmosphere. And since we have lignin, the lignin can also give uh, protect from uh, UV degradation. And uh, so this, that's uh, why this is kind of a multi-resistant coating. I will show you one other uh, example of what we can do with the lignin particles. And uh, this is uh, uh, to use these lignin particles for energy storage. So while the coating was an example of something that you can maybe think about that could be uh, that lignin could be useful for. This is a typical example that you cannot use the crude lignin for. So this uh, works only because we can make these uh, particles. So what we can make, what we have done is that we uh, co-precipitate the lignin with a phase changing material. Uh, so we form these hybrid particles. And the phase changing material uh, can be a fatty acid, in this case, a lauric acid, for example. And it's incorporated uh, in, so the, the lignin for, forms the shell, and then we have the phase changing material uh, inside. And the, the energy storage uh, uh, principle of phase changing material is that uh, we have a um, uh, when the it's a, it's using energy when it's uh, uh, when the it's melting and then it's again releasing heat when it's uh, solidifying and this uh, this process of of uh, of changing phases from from solid to liquid this can be used uh, for energy storage so this could be used to uh, then for example in in houses uh, to to store it, to use use the uh, energy we can get solar energy for example uh, and what was nice with this so normally you need some kind of uh, you need to uh, have the phase changing material somewhere otherwise it will of course leak out when it's uh, melting so this uh, we could show that this cycle could be done like uh, over a hundred times uh, without any change. So this could even, and since these are then can be in aqueous dispersion, this could even be uh, pumpable. So we could use this aqueous dispersion uh, uh, for this uh, energy storage. So to conclude uh, about colloidal lignin particles, they, they are are sustainable and they can replace uh, non-renewable and toxic chemicals in, in many applications. I only showed you a few ex examples, but we can make very good uh, uh, adhesives, for example, so that we can, we don't have this, uh, we can uh, get rid of not having any volatile uh, organic compounds, for example, but only this uh, natural lignin. And uh, this can also decrease the use of organic solvents. So I see that we, there's a lot of uh, potential with the lignin. And as you saw in this one, one example of the coating, uh, of course, lignin can also be a colorant. So here we can combine the, the color and the functionality. But let's go more into the, this color, biocolorants and uh, now I will show you some examples of work that uh, Rafael Grande has done, who is also presenting later today, and Tia Lofthanda. Uh, so it's not only the uh, compounds from trees or bark acts that are, uh, are interesting as biocolorants, but also we can also use many other bio extracts. So um, obviously, biocolorants have been used for a very long time. Even be before, um, it's, uh, it has been a traditional uh, dyeing method before the synthetic dyes uh, uh, 
took over the market. And now we are, of course, uh, due to the focus on sustainability, we are looking back uh, into this, that could we, be, could we use the, the bio-based uh, tolerance and how could we use them? But uh, there's not so much uh, focus on, the, on these uh, methods from a scientific point of view. So what we want in my group, we want to really understand what's going on. So uh, how, how do the compounds absorb onto the uh, textile or, or packaging or what we are uh, wanting to dye? And also how, how, can, how can we, by changing different parameters, uh, change this? And what we have so far looked into is uh, two different extracts. Uh, from willow bark extract and uh, red onion extract. So um, related to the willow bark extract, uh, this is mainly work by T. Yellow Thunder. So um, she has systematically uh, characterized uh, this willow bark and found that it, of course, this is very typical to natural material. The synthetic dyes are usually just one compound. When you take a natural extract, we have a lot of compounds there. So first question might be like, which one is giving the color and, uh, and such a thing. So this makes the, the research with, with the natural uh, extracts much more uh, demanding. So she, she combined the uh, chemical characterization uh, with also uh, studying the, the absorption to cellulose substrates and also show, showed that this uh, willow bark extract could uh, dye both the uh, natural yarns and also uh, films from nanocellulose, for example. But the willow bark extracts are not only interesting as, uh, as a bio uh, by a colorant, uh, it's an active compound, and it, and we can utilize that in um, in many other applications also. So, um, for example, can uh, we have added value from these extracts, and we can, for example, make uh, double uh, gels. So this double gel works so, so that we have the uh, nanocellulose. And this nanocellulose forms a gel uh, by physical uh, contact. So the, the fibrils are, are interconnected basically uh, by physical means. They, they form some uh, hydrogen bonding when they get close enough to each other. But it's a lot of uh, uh, about physical uh, interactions. And then we can form, form another gel uh, using this extract so they can uh, be cross-linked either using UV, UV irradiation or enzy enzymatic means. So then we can form this other uh, gel around the uh, nanocellulose gel and it, we get an, a, a double gel. And this uh, uh, gel can be used for different, uh, different things. But it's interesting because these extracts have, have a lot of their active compounds as I told you, so they can also be used as uh, uh, for UV uh, to protect from UV degradation or as a uh, radical scavenger. And the, so this, uh, these extracts could be quite useful uh, for packaging uh, when, for example, uh, oxygen would, would lead to a uh, spoilage of, of the food and um, and I would also say that there, so here we can combine the, the nice color uh, with some functionality and make, make novel materials also. Uh, the other extract we have been looking into now is this uh, uh, red onion uh, extract. And uh, here the now I want to show a bit of an example also how we want to study more the uh, fundamental uh, understanding of this. So um, the quercetin is, is 
one of the main compounds, but again, maybe not the only one. So that's uh, the problem is that we, we don't have an isolated molecule in the extract. And um, it doesn't, if we don't use any mordants, uh, just use these uh, flavonoids, it doesn't absorb very strongly uh, to the cellulose. So this is easily removed during uh, washing, for example. So um, in real life, usually different kind of mordants are use, used. These mordants are quite often metal salts. And these metal salts uh, can both change the color and contaminate the water. So we want to look into uh, if we could uh, use a more sustainable approach and uh, use a biomordant that wouldn't change the color and that would be more uh, also non-toxic and wouldn't uh, contaminate uh, waters. So, um, as said, this uh, uh, textile dyeing is actually a, not a very sustainable business. So there's a lot to be done to, to make it more sustainable, to decrease the use of, of uh, water in the, in the dyeing, and also to decrease the use of these metal mordants uh, that can then uh, contaminate uh, the water. So even if we are going to the using the biocolorants, we should also think about the whole process to make it more uh, sustainable. And uh, this is a uh, here uh, is an example of how how these dyed uh, fabrics look. So if we take the white cotton fabric and use the red onion extract, uh, we get a nice pink color. But this pink color is uh, does not uh, withstand uh, washing. So clearly, it changes color with and becomes lighter uh, with, with the washing, especially if we are using detergents. So we need a more than a set. Uh, if we use the commonly used uh, iron containing more than, it gets brown. So this is not very uh, nice. If we wanted to have, have the pink color and we get the brown color instead. Uh, so with, with the natural more than we tested, we could actually retain this nice uh, color and it was also could withstand uh, washing rather well. And what we wanted to do was, was understand this a bit better. So we have used the uh, quartz crystal microbalance with dissipation to study the adsorption uh, on a more or less molecular way um, level. So we are studying uh, what we, we are then using like model model cellulose substrates made from uh, nanocellulose. And then we are studying the change in, in a frequency uh, upon adsorption. So when uh, this crystal is vibrating and then when uh, something, when the mass is increasing, the vibration slows down and we see this as a decrease in, fre in frequency. So here we can study, uh, follow the kinetics of, of the adsorption both of the biomordant and then the bio-based colorant and see whether they are removed upon rinsing or not. And this rinsing, this was just with, with the buffer, but of course we could also rinse with a detergent to kind of show how, how strongly this uh, colorant is absorbed. So this is something we are working more on to also to uh, study the different compounds uh, in the extract to see which one are the most uh, absorbing the most. But I, I assume that uh, Rafael will tell you more about this. So I will just uh, come to the conclusion. I hope I have shown you now some examples of how our research is inspired from nature. So for example, looking into how this hydrophobic uh, uh, lotus leaves, for example, works. We can uh, use the same approach when we want to make a hydrophobic uh, textile coating or wood coating. And then we can utilize these uh, functional compounds uh, from nature, whether it's extracts or lignin. And most interestingly, we can combine the color and the functionality. So with this, I want to thank you for your 
attention. And I guess we don't have much time for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Monica. There is actually one question for you. Okay. Uh, what are natural mordants that you recommend to use with uh, biocolorants? Well, we are much too early in the research to, to give you uh, suggestions yet. We have uh, looked into Kydosan and that looks uh, quite promising. Okay, thank you. Okay. And the next speaker will then be Rafael. Uh, please, Rafael is the researcher at, the, uh, at this biocolor project, so he will tell about his work. Thank you, Hika. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today I'll talk a little bit about the work that I have been developing in Auto University. This is uh, mainly related to the biocolor project. But uh, first of all, I am Rafael. I'm a material science engineering uh, from Brazil. I'm also a polymer engineering. And this is my second time here in Finland. In 2018, I have been here working in Auto as a visitor postdoc. And then uh, in 2020, I had this uh, cr contract in Auto. I like it so much Finland that I decided to come back and then I have the contract until uh, January next year. And then in Auto, I have been mainly working the biocolor project. And this is interesting how the idea by that using colorants from nature has an important role to this history. Uh, in Roman Empire, for instance, uh, uh, purple became a symbol of power because it was uh, obtained from Tyrion purple or royal purple, as known in that age. Uh, this uh, important dye, very expensive, were obtained from sea needles. And uh, the clothes obtained from uh, dyeing using this material could be only used by important people in politics and even the emperor, emperors. Uh, and as you can imagine, it was really difficult to harvest the raw material, which is the sea snails and also to process and obtain the dye itself. Uh, basically, they cook this material in a uh, large amount of water, and it becomes difficult to store and then to uh, keep the material from contamination and these kind of things. And it is interesting how a uh, uh, long time passed, and we kind of have the same problems to develop new uh, bio-based dyes. So in my point of view, biocolor has two big challenges to overcome. And one of them is to obtain new sources to get these uh, materials. And of course, make them more competitive to the synthetic dyes. And the second challenge is to improve the production and uh, the, uh, obtain them in a large scale. So I'll go through. Uh, my work and how we are trying to overcome this challenge in our research group. So, as Monica mentioned before, we have been using two, uh, basically two raw materials, red onions and willow bark, and from then we can get this beautiful pink color or purple color, and also the uh, yellow ones. So, first of all, let's address the uh, problem of the large-scale production. So, as I mentioned before, if we uh, are thinking to get a material that can be commercialized, we also have to think about the cost. And if you just cook the material in a large amount of water, we have the problem of the transportation, because basically what we have is a, a, a material that is made uh, from water. So, you are basically transporting water and this will increase the price. And of course, you also have the problem with the logistics, how you're going to store this material and keep it from contamination and this kind of stuff. So what we have suggested is use the spray drying process to dry these uh, extracts. And the spray drying is a quite simple technique. So you have the hot air being 
injected in a dry chamber, in a big dry chamber. And then you have air, hot airflow inside the instrument. And also at the top, we can inject our liquid from the extracts. And this liquid will be, uh, go through a part that is similar to fire sprinklers that will break the liquid to small droplets. And the hot air will dry the, the droplets and also carry the material until the collective vessel. And then we have the material already in powder form. And one of the advantages uh, by using this technique is that it's already available in industry. So this is one of the major methods to get milk powder, protein powders, or even coffee. And our initial results uh, using onion extracts show that the, uh, the techni technique is very suitable for our purpose. We get this nice uh, purple powdered material, which is uh, compo composed by small particles, as you can see in the pictures. And the particle size is important because they will also help to redisperse this material according to your needs. So now if you want to have uh, five grams of material, you just pick five grams of the powder. You don't need to like, uh, work with 500 milliliters or higher amounts of uh, water. So as you can see, the dispersibility in water is still uh, very, uh, very nice. And in the second part, uh, we have to improve the properties of these dyes. And these uh, require to better understand the chemistry behind these materials, these compounds. And of course, uh, how these material is attached to the substrates, to the textiles. And these require more fundamental understanding. So to address and uh, check these um, issues, we have been using the quart crystal microbalance, which is just a very fancy balance that, can, that is very sensitive. And when I say sensitive, I mean that it can measure uh, the change in the weight by just a few uh, macro macromolecules being absorbed. So you probably have seen this image before uh, held by the tweezer. We have the sensor of the instrument. And in the reflective part, in the sensor, we coat it with cellulose, which is our model material to the textiles. And then the, the sensor has some vibration. And when you put inside the machine, when we inject the dyes, if some dyes is absorbed to, into the uh, cellulose, then we, uh, the frequency change, and then we can collect some data from it. So this is uh, the typical curve that we obtain using this technique. I will not go in much detail about it, but I can tell that the um, uh, change in the frequency has low values. It means that the absorption is not that strong. And when we rinse to simulate the washing of these textiles, part of the material is removed. Here we have uh, more or less 25% of the material that were removed. And what we have learned from these initial results is that the extracts, they are attracted by the cellulose, but not that much because we have water involved. And here probably the involved force, they are hydrogen bounding. And then when you have a lot of water in your system, you are competing with water. And then you have a lot of uh, uh, hydrogen there. And it's difficult to coordinate the binding between the dyes and the textile. So what they usually uh, do in industry, they use substance to improve this interaction. Uh, materials that has stronger forces involved, like electrostatic charges. And for this, they go for metal. But the problem with the metal salts is that uh, you have the contamination of water. So this is one of the major problems in dye industry. So what we uh, have suggested is the use of some substance that can be bio-based, obtain it. So like chitosan, for instance. Chitosan is a polymer that can be obtained from crab shells, and this can come from uh, food waste, 
for instance. And in certain conditions, this material can have some positive charge in the molecule, uh, charge similar to the uh, salts, uh, metal salts itself. So they can act similarly to the metal ions. So they improve the coordination between the bonds. And if this works, it can act as a biomordant. And our initial results were very exciting because, uh, as you can see, the red curve I have already shown, it is the material without any mordant. When we add the metal ion, of course, the absorption was improved because this is like how they use in industry. But by using chitosan, the, in terms of absorption, it, it worked even better. We had even higher absorption. And not only that, Monica already mentioned this, but chitosan also also help it to keep the color. So we have some fabrics. Uh, the white one is a cotton fabric. And then we have, of course, the head onion without any mordants. We had this nice pink color. And then chitosan helped to keep the same color. And when you use the mordant salts, usually it changes the color of the fabric. So chitosan not only improved the absorption of this material, but also keep the same color. So, as a conclusion, we had a good progress in using natural mordants. Of course, chitosan is just the first. Further studies are needed to prove uh, the use of this material as a mordant. And we have also shown that QCMD, or the quart crystal microbalance, can be used as a powerful tool to investigate these interactions. And the spray dryer is a suitable technique to improve the production of this Ties. So I just want to finish saying that uh, as a foreigner working uh, far from home, uh, these corona times is not uh, being very easy, but uh, the colors that we have here in Finland make everything a little bit easier. And thank you. Thank you, Rafael. And it is our pleasure that you are working with us in this. Biocolo project and thank you. I'm very happy to be involved in this project. Yeah, great. And in in our uh, research, we uh, different teams work together. So we have also made some dyings and and Raphael makes the measurements and so on. So thanks for the introduction. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the next speaker. Then we get uh, um, Mikko from the University of. Eastern Finland from Kuopio. So let's go to Mikko's presentation. Mikko's, Mikko and, and Jaana Rysäs team are, are involved with the toxicity testing of natural colorants. So please go ahead, Mikko. Thank you, Rika, and good afternoon, everyone. So I was asked to give a short presentation uh, how I ended up to this project and what I'm doing. So here it is. So my background is in environmental science, which I studied in the University of Eastern Finland, or it was University of Kuopio when I started. Uh, I graduated in 2012, and after that I was working two years as a health inspector at the city of Rauma. But in 2014, I came back to the university and I started my PhD studies uh, in the Department of Environmental and Biological Sciences. And in 2018, I defended my thesis and got my PhD ready. Uh, in that, I was studying the electro health effects of electromagnetic fields, especially xenotoxicity and genomic instability. And in 2019, uh, I changed it to the School of Pharmacy at the UEF when I was hired in this biocolor project. And as Rika already mentioned, we have a small team in Kuopio led by Professor Jana Rysä. Then it's me and Dr. Astudent Johanna Yliöyrä. And at the moment we have one master 
PhD student working in the lab, Evi Huskonen. So what we are doing in this project is the toxicity testing for these novel biocolorants which are developed in this project. And why we do that? Of course, we want to be sure that these new colorants are safe to use and we need this toxicity data for the risk assessment. And it's good to notice that uh, if, if something comes from the nature or, bio, or is biobased, it's not necessarily mean that it's safe. Basically, we can think that everything is toxic, but uh, it's the amount or the dose which makes the poison. Even the water is toxic if, if you drink too much that. Uh, but it's thinking about the toxicology. It's not only about the toxicity of the compound, but uh, the risk depends much also about that how we are exposed. Even if the compound is very toxic, it's not a big, big risk if, if we rarely are exposed to that. But if we are often exposed, like wearing a cloth every day, then the risk could be even higher if the compound itself is not so toxic. And how to do toxicity testing? Uh, we are working in a laboratory and in vitro, which means that we are using the culture itself. And here in the middle, you can see picture from the cell culture. These are human liver cancer cells, which are used for the toxicity studies. On the left side, you can see it's Johanna working there. Uh, she's passing the cells from the um, cell culture flask, flasks to the well plates where we do the assays. And here is the incubator where the cells are growing nicely or most of the time nicely, sometimes there are a little bit problems. Uh, the temperature is 37 degrees and there is 5% uh, carbon dioxide inside. And there are flasks, well plates, disease, so the cells can be grown uh, with different plates and uh, they, are, they are growing in the cell culture medium where they get the so-called food, what they need. So the next step is the exposure to biocolorants. And in the middle, we have biocolorants extracted from, from the mushroom called blood red web cap. And these are different anthraquinone colorants, which Laurent uh, already told of in his presentations. For example, emodine, dermorubine, dermosibine. And these are diluted in the cell culture medium and then put in the cells on the well plates. And then the cells are exposed there, usually 24 hours. And after the exposure, we take the photographs with the microscope from the cells so we can check if there are differences with different exposures. In, in the how, how the cells are looking there. And then we have several different assays to study toxicity endpoints. Uh, in this project, we are starting with quite usual endpoints like cell viability, cytotoxicity, or this kind of reactive oxygen species production. This may lead to DNA damage in the cells. And we are also testing the skin sensitization with the cells. So, so a little bit this allergy thing. And usually these assays are so that we pipette some reagent for the cells and then incubate that. It depends on the assay. It can be 15 minutes or one hour or four hours. And after that, we are measuring it with the well plate reader here. We can measure usually the endpoints what we are measuring are fluorescence or absorbance. And after the measurement, we get data. 
Usually it's the Excel data, lots of numbers in the Excel. And from that, we can then calculate uh, and, and make the nice figures. Here are two different assays, Mitosox and DHC. Uh, those are measuring the one Oh, 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 me measuring oxidative stress, uh, the superoxide production inside the cell. Not going to the details, but here we have different doses of our colorant, the dermocypene. So in here we can see that it's increasing it at the highest doses. Here is the control, so it's not exposed to, at all to colorant, it's just a cell culture medium. And this is just for example, a couple of endpoints. We have lots of those and we, we then combine all the data and see if there are any, any risks or not based on these assays. And there are also other ways to study toxicity, not only this in vitro. So in, in this biocolor project, the ecotoxicity and aquatic toxicity are studied with the invertebrates or zebrafish in, in Brazil, in, in Professor Gisela Umbuseiro's laboratory, where I was visiting just before this corona epidemic started. And here I'm working with there are those Japneas, so water please, very small. And then other way to study toxicity is the animal experiments, which are usually needed for carcinogenicity studies, but we are not using to, uh, at all animal experiments in the biocolor project. So this was the short overview for the toxicity studies. And if somebody is interested about toxicology or studying that, please visit to the University of Eastern Finland website, we have the master degree program of toxicology. Thank you. Okay, thank you Mikko. Very uh, interesting and very important studies you are doing with this uh, toxicity testing for, for the dyes that we are investigating. Okay, as we are Dealing with, with natural colorants and biocolorants, they are of course colorful and therefore they are also uh, can be used for painting and art. And today we have here Ina Koskinen and Ono Kiviluoto at backstage from the University of Helsinki Chemistry Lab Kadolin, and they will present Art of Chemistry. Please. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. My name is Ida. I'm from Chemistry Lab Gadolin at the University of Helsinki. We are a non-formal science education environment that students, well, outside of the pandemic situation that we have going on, can visit at the university campus. Um, I myself am studying at the University of Helsinki to become a uh, chemistry, physics and maths teacher one day. But aside of my studies, I am actually doing quite a bit of work with music. Uh, I sing in all the jazz. However, today I will not be presenting you with any kind of musical shenanigans. But instead, I wanted to step out of my comfort zone a little bit. And today, um, I shall make my debut as a visual artist. Uh, may I present to you my very first watercolor paintings. Aren't they fabulous? I myself am pretty proud of them, but I'm pretty sure that most of you could also do a better job than I could. So today I want to show you how you can actually make watercolors from natural, col natural colorants yourself. The key ingredient here is to use either red cabbage that is chopped up, I have some of it right here, or 
bilberries. Keep in mind they have to be bilberries that can be, for example, found in the Finnish nature. Blueberries that are a bit bigger, they won't work. They have to be bilberries. Yeah, the key ingredient here is to use either one of these because these very um, substances contain anthocyanins that work as pH indicators. That is a very interesting property that we could actually use to make some art. Now, first things first, we take a cup full of uh, either the red cabbage or the bilberries and some boiled water. It's been a hot minute since this was actually boiled, but let's hope it's warm enough still. So we soak the bilberries and the red cabbage in the hot water. Oh yeah, it's steaming. That's a good sign. It's probably warm enough. Then give it a little bit of a stir. So that all the colors will get out. Yay, that looks good. And then we take a paintbrush that we can use to wash over a sheet of paper. Now we can see that the color of the bilberries is actually quite red and not that blue, even though they're also called blueberries. Or at least in the very beginning, it's quite red, but it's turning out slightly more bluish. Hmm. And then we got the red cabbage. Let's see how that looks. Not that vibrant, at least. Let's give it a little bit more of a stir. Oh yeah, that's better. So red cabbage, that looks blue, right? And then bilberries, blueberries, that look more red. That's interesting, to say the least. Now, you want to tape the sheet of paper that you're using to the surface that you're working on that you hopefully have protected very well because blueberry stains, it stains real bad. Um, you should probably tape it to the surface because otherwise the paper might get all crumbled up because it's quite wet. And um, however, we do not want our first layer of paint to be red, uh, wet while we're gonna work on it furthermore. So, um, because you know, watching, quite literally, watching paint dry wouldn't be that good of a in entertainment, wouldn't it? So um, luckily, um, I stayed at work till quite late last night to make some already dried up versions of our washed up papers. So now is the part where it gets interesting because here we have two really beautiful shades of blue, but I mean, blue isn't really my favorite color, as you can probably see. Um, I would pref prefer it to have some more, more colors aside from just, just the blue. So today I brought with me some vinegar and some lemon and lime juices and baking soda and different washing liquids. So, let's begin off with some vinegar. Oof, still don't like the smell, but anything for the sake of art and science. Let's grab a smaller paintbrush. You know, the roses I showed you earlier, they, they are really the only thing I can really paint, so I'm going to paint some more of them, hopefully some one of you wants to try something something else besides from flowers. Let's start with the red cabbage. That is suddenly a lot more red, as is the blueberry bilberry that it's dripping onto.
Now we could also use a different acid because you know vinegar is acidic, and that's why the pH indicator that is in both the red cabbage and the bilberry change the color. We could use another acid. Let's go with some lemon juice. Yay, some more red shades. That's my kind of a shade. Nice one. But, um, if we got flowers right here, they also need some stems and some leaves. So let's do some baking soda. That is, of course, a powder. Let's put some of it right here. And then just add some good old H2O. Give that a stir. And um, yeah. Some more stirring. Yeah, that's looking real good. And to the other flowers as well. Yay. You know, this is something that you could actually try out with like your kids if you have some, or if you're a teacher, perhaps at school with your, your students. This could work well in both science class and in art class, or both. Now, I know this isn't really a, this isn't really a natural colorant, but yet, let's use some um, washing powder. So let's put some of that in a little bit more to add a finishing touch. I'm not sure what the actual finishing touch will be. Oh yeah, I got just the right one for you. Wait a second, I want to do it in secret. A more stirring action? Yes. Just wait a little second. So thank you to everyone that was here today to watch our presentation and everyone else's presentations. Let's give them a round of applause because I think everyone was great today. And I'm Ida from Chemistry Lab Gadolin. And now back to Rita. Rita, I'm sorry. OK, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ida. So very lovely lovely paintings, and now we even got the recipe, so we can go and do this by ourselves. Thank you, it was really great. So thank you everybody, and thank you Ina for your uh, nice and uh, spectacular art. We will enjoy it in our memories after this and um, thanks everybody and have a nice evening and afternoon and see you later bye bye <laughs>